Um, what I want to do today is to talk about, so this is the overall distribution of the students and um, the large-scale um, application of the SRF um, assessment. What I want to do today is um, really talk about what is it that we do with the students who are having moderate comprehension, as Mark made the point, um, the questions really weren't that onerous. Nor as somebody who studies text complexity would I argue that the texts are that incredibly hard. So we would have expected kids to do fairly well um, on, on, in terms of comprehension. Mark really focused on the kids here in the left-hand corner, those who are fast and inaccurate, showing this rapid reading pattern. But I want to make three points quickly today. Um, my first one is, um, you know, and Mark, maybe you want to turn off your um, mic. All right. Yeah. Um, the first point that I want to make is that most students can recognize the majority of words. I think Mark's um, presentation really emphasized that. But I'm going to argue that what our kids are lacking is the ability to stay with the task. And I want to provide you some data that shows that. And I'm going to suggest that stamina in silent reading can be and needs to be taught. Now, in Mark's concern really, I mean, in talking for about the validity of the measure, this question about these inaccurate, really rapid readers really needs attention. But I also would suggest that we've got you know, about 60% of the kids who really have some issues with proficient silent reading behaviors. So I want to start by just underscoring the point that from every available data we have, including from special studies associated with the National Assessment, we can conclude that most American kids can recognize the majority of the words in text. This comes from, um, you know, based on thousands of kids on the Dibbles assessments. And what you're seeing are the 10, 25, and 50 percent word recognition accuracy in oral reading at the end of grade three. So by the end of grade three, what you're seeing is that even kids in the 10th percentile have made the 90 percent mark that experts such as Mari Clay and Steve Stahl said was our target in terms of basic comprehension. And it turns out at the end of grade two, um, the 10% is at about 88% um, percent accuracy, and the uh, 25th percent already has attained this level. But what you're seeing, and we can ask some questions, of course, about the Dibbles comprehension, but what you're seeing is comprehension is really poor. They are able to. Um, actually pronounce most of the words in a text. Second piece of evidence um, to say that kids are lacking in stamina, I mean, when we typically you look at silent reading comprehension on measures such as the National Assessment, um, which basically does comparisons across states, uh, we see about a third of our kids, 36 percent, getting to the proficient level, sort of close to what we're seeing in terms of the kids who are doing very well on the comprehension measure on the silent reading fluency with comprehension assessment, but we're seeing the rest of the, the kids doing poorly in terms of their comprehension. We really don't know what's happening, right? Because on the, on the national assessment, you get a long passage, you need to answer questions. But what my colleagues and I have done is we've actually looked at what kids are doing in sections of assessment. So what we've done is taken a five-part um, passage. I mean, this pa these are sections of a passage that are really coherent, followed by questions. And what we see is the kids in the bottom quartile read with reasonable rates in that first uh, portion of the passage. And then they start engaging in what you saw as this rapid reading. You know, it's kind of like I've given it up. You know, I gave it the office. We see that pattern with kids in the 
second from the bottom quartile, they stay with the passage for about 40% um, of it. And then kids in the um, top two quartiles, they finish the passage at the similar rate. Okay, so I, I hope that that made sense. What I'm saying here is that the kids in the <clears throat> bottom quartile are able to read the passage with pretty good comprehension and with um, a decent reading rate, but once they get to the other portions, they quickly start engaging in this disfluent silent reading behavior. Kids from the second, from the bottom quartile start doing that after the second set of passages or the second chunk of passage. So I, what I've suggested is that our kids can actually recognize words and typically when we start interventions often we start really emphasizing things around decoding um, and what I'm suggesting here is that what they're really lacking is focus and attention in silent reading. And I'm going to give you four actions for application in schools. I think any one of these actions would be would have an amazing effect in classrooms and in terms of kids' stamina. So, so basically what we're saying here is what you're seeing on statewide tests isn't that the kids can't read, it's that they don't read after a certain point. And if the passages are long, as they are in most state and tests and in the national assessment, it really doesn't help you if you only read part of the passage as a really attentive reader when all of the questions are at the end. So the first action that I'm going to suggest is that we decrease the amount of assisted reading and increase student reading of instructional text. I want to underscore here that I'm, what I'm talking about is instructional text. I'm not talking about teachers reading aloud some really great texts, um, you know, really great stories that they're communicating with their kids or really great informational text. I'm talking about the text that states or districts or schools have purchased to help kids develop reading. What we've seen immensely in the last decade is that we've got a lot of teacher doing the reading for kids and asking the kids to follow along. And it turns out that this is even happening at the high school levels. So as part of the Reading for Understanding study, which was a big federal initiative to um, help understand how we can improve comprehension, um, Sharon Vaughn and her colleagues went into ELA, science and social studies classrooms in high school. And they found that there was a reasonable re amount of reading going on. But actually, when they found out what kind of reading it was, it turned out that the majority of the reading was kids ostensibly, and I underscore that word ostensibly, following along as their teachers read the instructional text. And what I'm suggesting here is that as the texts are perceived to be harder, or as we perceive our kids to be less capable, it actually turns out teachers are doing a lot of the reading for kids. And I don't think we need to have research that says that when teachers do the reading, it's typically the teachers who are going to get better at the reading. So what I'm suggesting is we need to look for ways to increase kids' involvement in their own reading, more eyes on the text. One of the ways in which I think you do that is to actually talk with students about the presence of new words and text. Um, some research on eye movements um, of the same kind that I was showing you with those sections of passages indicates that when there are too many words that the kids don't think they know, that's one of the things that contributes to this dropping out or dropping off in terms of attentive reading. So one of the things that we've done at Text Project, the not-for-profit that I uh, run, is to develop some sample conversations. So this is available at Text Project. Talking with kids that you're always going to see some new hard words in text. And we have a lot of information as a result of research on vocabulary that actually tells us how many hard words we can anticipate at different grade levels. 
So as a middle schooler, you're always going to have about seven to eight words you've probably not seen before. That doesn't mean you can't figure them out. But you have to be prepared for having those words. Second thing, or excuse me, third, is that giving kids consistent opportunities to read magazine articles is one way to really increase this, I'm responsible for my own reading. I don't need to go into the fact that um, um, you know magazine articles are the primary kind of text that are on um, on assessments. I have a lot of reasons for reading magazines in classrooms beyond this. First of all, it gives kids great background knowledge. Magazine articles are typically intact, and you can develop a complete idea in that article, and for kids who haven't been doing a great deal of their own reading, it's a manageable task to see a magazine article. Now, one of the things we've done at Text Project to support this reading of magazine articles is we provided a set of about 100 um, open access, that means they're for free download, texts that are really geared to ensuring that kids get a lot of exposure to the core vocabulary, the words that account for the majority of the words in text. Okay, so we've got about a hundred of these different passages. They're on um, lots of topics that give you background knowledge, including human interest stories about American kids. So you can read about kids like yourself who are doing interesting things. Another source for fabulous magazine articles is readworks.org. And in fact, again, open access, all, um, all free downloads at the site. And ReadWorks has actually been sponsoring an initiative called um, An Article a Day. And they've been clustering sets of articles thematically. Here's an example of some that I've clustered from the site on architecture and engineering. There are lots of interesting topics that we can engage kids in. So the third idea was, have kids read magazine articles. It's a great way to increase kids' responsibility for text. It also helps you develop background knowledge, and they're really interesting. We've had great responses from kids who have been involved in this article a day initiative. Finally, consistently help kids to remember what they've read and why we read. We read to learn things. Narratives, we read to learn about the human condition. An informational text we read to find out, oh, by the way, this is supposed to be a brain um, synapses. But we read to get knowledge about so many different parts of our world, right? About weather and clothing and um, courage and all kinds of things, um, animals. So we want kids to have opportunities guided by their teachers initially and then more and more on their own. For example, in the Read Works, an article a day, kids have their own knowledge books where they actually record what it is that they've learned. Why is it that we read? We read to find out interesting things. And we really need to emphasize that for kids. And there are lots of different ways in which we can make um, these maps. By the way, we have a whole set of them with related pictures at Text Project in a project called Word Pictures. So I um, welcome you to come to Text Project. What I've said today is that reading stamina is what is the really critical proficiency that our kids are struggling with at this point. What I've said is it's, it's not that they can't recognize words, it's that they haven't read enough to get really good at it. And they also haven't had the reading stamina task scaffolded for them. They actually haven't been engaged and taught how to read silently. I'm saying this is something that's teachable. I've um, edited a book that, like everything at Text Project, is um, available for open access. And here's the URL. Um, yes, it does cost something at Amazon. You can't get anything on Amazon without charging something. So I'd recommend that you go to some of these other sites.